we are very pleased to welcome back Laral. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, in 2014, I wanted to switch from which, not switch, I wanted to do robotics uh, as well because of obvious reasons. And then I bought after begging Marshall. And so the first robot that I bought, the money came from Marshall. And I bought a backstep and I put it in Smith Hall, thinking I will use it. For one year, nothing happened. I tried to convince, being in Robotics Institute, I think it is easy to do robotics for me, someone like me. I, I talked to so many students that come and work with me, but no one wanted to trust me. Uh, because I was doing vision, I had no idea of robotics. Like if you ask me kin kinematics 101 or mechanics of manipulation 101, I have no idea. Like I cannot even write the equations of the, uh, kin for me it's always like input and output and there's a machine learning thing in the middle and nothing else, right? So no one wanted to work with me. At that point of time, Level decided to take a bet with me and he became my first uh, master student. And of course, I mean, he did amazing. I mean, I think I have to say that my best memories of my early, early uh, assistant professor or whatever that thing is, is from those days where we tried to make this robot work for the first time. And of course, uh, you do, the, all the things that we know about large scale learning and robotics, you might think that it comes from somewhere, but it was actually born in Smith Hall. No one before that used to do any large scale learning and robotics together. There were like two separate words which were never put together. And so Lerel has the honor of being the first one to bring large scale learning to robotics in the, for the first time, essentially. And it got a reward as well. I mean, it got the best paper. His first paper got the best paper, student best paper award as well. I should have retired at that point of time from <laughs> robotics. Uh, that would have been the right philosophy. Uh, but in any case, Level did continue to do really, really good things uh, even during his PhD, including the home robots, which still remains my dream and hopefully Level can really take it someplace, sometime go out of industrial robotics. Then he moved to NYU, uh, oh, he did postdoc with Alyosha and uh, Peter for one year, and then he moved to NYU and then he has continued to get getting best, best paper awards or being finalist for the best paper awards. I think or uh, RSSM, I don't remember exactly, but some, some best paper awards and so on. And he has continued to do some really, really good work with, for scaling up learning even more and doing it even better. And so I will take, let Level take it away and tell us what he is doing now and how we should be changing our view of the world. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the really nice introduction. Uh, speaking about fond memories at CMU, there's also a lot of non-research fond memories that you can uh, you can ask a winner for and try to get a lot of them. But yeah, it's very nice to be back here at CMU, seeing so many new faces that you know are are people I've never seen like four four to five years ago. Um, so before I start on the research side, I want to show you a video. It's a video from one of my most favorite movies of uh, last year. It's the Pinocchio movie from Del Toro. Uh, it's a fully stop motion animation movie. So what that means is that every single frame in this movie was created by a human artist using their hands and intricately manipulating everything in the scene, right? So when you go and watch the movie, it's this wonderful visual experience. But as a roboticist, when you watch it, you just realize what a huge gap exists between what humans can do with their hands in these interesting environments and what our robots of today are able to do. Right? As, as a roboticist, we're still struggling to figure out how to pick and place objects, how to push objects on a tabletop, whereas humans can do these amazing, crazy things. At the same time, if you peer into the windows of, uh, in, in the MLD and see what uh, language people are doing, there's like a revolution happening, right? There's these large language models where even if you ask it, what are the biggest problems in robotics, it says things like autonomy, safety, human-robot interaction, all things which are actual important problems to solve in robotics. And it's not just in language. Even in vision, I can send in a prompt like this, and you can get these stunning images, right, just from this app, right? And it also, like, accurately follows the same, uh, same text prompt. So clearly, the world of machine learning has moved so front in, like, language and vision and so the obvious question in robotics is how do we get the same level of capabilities in robot models, right? And of course, there are many schools of thought over here. There are so many researchers uh, looking at different lines of approaches. And what I want to do in the beginning is to give you how I see 
the various approaches in this area. So the first line of approaches is what I call a nativist approach, which is we as roboticists bake in as much information we know about the world into robots, right? So this sort of prior information, it can either be in the form of some friction models, it can be in the form of knowing how joint mechanics works, how collision works, for example, a Mujoko simulator, or even you can let the robot know where exactly every chair, every table, every shelf is, and do some planning on top of it. Right, this is a very standard school of thought, and you know, it has yielded some amazing successes. For example, it's yielded these things like amazing act flipping robots, amazing hand robots which can do uh, Rubik's Cube manipulation as well. But at the same time, when you see these amazing videos of robots, you should also acknowledge how much effort has gone into make just this one demo work, right? This is a large group of people in a big company trying to model exactly everything in the environment, trying to structure everything in that environment, transferring things from simulation to real, optimizing things in simulation. There's so much of effort for each of these things, due to which each of them have taken multiple years with a big team, right? So in opposition to this, there's the other school of thought, where it's like, okay, let's just say that the robots don't start off with knowing everything about the world. Instead, what, this, what our robots are going to do is that they're going to interact with the world. They're going to interact with the world, get data, and learn from this data, right? So you can, you can think of a robot going out there, having its data, building models on its data, and if your models are not that good, you can go back, get more data, and keep improving your models, right? So as Abhinav said, this is something which I worked on as my first project at CMU, and we saw that, you know, this is a reasonable way to go if you want to figure out how to grasp objects. So we showed it in, uh, sort of 2015, and it was scaled up by increasing the order of magnitude by folks at Google as well. Okay, so have we solved the problem? Well, have, like, these algorithms have never moved past grasping or pushing objects, so clearly not. So what's the problem over here? So, okay, so to, to understand the problem, let's look at some studies in language. So in 2020, there was a, uh, there was a paper from OpenAI which was studying the effects of data set size with a test loss or test error. Okay, so what they see is that if you increase the amount of data uh, exponentially, you get a linear, uh, linear uh, sort of, our loss goes down linearly, right? But the thing to note is that in our data set size, these numbers here are like 100 billion to 1 trillion, right? So the scale of data we are talking about in these type of Abula Rasa learning from scratch a process is just incredibly large. In fact, if you put the current scale of robotics data, it is strongly on the negative side, right? Even on the log scale, it's like so poor. And due to this, the sort of tasks we can solve here are also quite simple, just grasping and pushing tasks. So how do we solve this? How do we break this problem of, uh, of learning from scratch and try to still be efficient with this philosophy of interacting and learning from the world? Well, I think the answer lies in this cute video of a cat learning. So what I want to see here is a pet owner trying to teach his pet how to open a door. And clearly when you see, as the cat starts off, it fails most of the time. But over time, after this teaching, the cat does figure out how to apply enough force to open the door. And then after it's learned it, it can do it all the time and get these wonderful rewards from its human. Okay, so, so this is what I want to create. I want to create robotic systems which follow more of something which I call a, a constructivist approach, where you have humans in the loop and the humans are going to guide the learning and interaction of our robots as they're building their models, as they're uh, collecting their data, as they're adapting, as they're looking at the world. So this is, so, so, so here's the theme of what I'll be speaking about, speaking about today. Okay, so I should also acknowledge that this is not uh, a new idea. Actually, it's been done since the 80s. Uh, this, so this is a video from Chris Atkinson uh, in the late 80s and 90s, where he was teaching robots to do these amazing skills. And the reason he was able to do this is because he knew how to solve the skills and he was showing it to the robot. 
Uh, and even more recently, we have uh, approaches which are looking to, to embody this idea of imitation and, ha and having humans in the loop. Okay, so as you see these videos, also notice that, okay, I'm, I'm saying that this is a new idea or I'm saying that this is an idea which is going to speed up learning, speed up robotics. But again, if you look at newer work, they're still doing grasping, pick and place, pushing objects, right? So it's still, you know, we haven't gone past this regime of, uh, of solving really hard, intricate, uh, intricate tasks. Okay, so let's start from there. Let's say I want to solve something really interesting, really hard on a dexterous hand. So this is an Allegro hand which we have in our lab, and let's say you want to solve something interesting here. How can a human show examples over here? So one idea is you wear a cyber glove, right? So this is a, st a standard tool, and with this you can, as you move your hand, the robot hand can move its own hand. The problem over here is that these type of approaches are quite expensive, and you also need to put in a lot of effort in calibrating the system for each and every human who has to use it. Okay, so another approach on the other end of the spectrum, which is really cheap, is you just take images of human hands, uh, estimate the hand pose, and then transfer those hand poses onto, onto the robot hand. Uh, again, you know, it works well in certain cases. We worked on it, uh, folks at CMU have also worked on this. But what we see is that, you know, just from a single image, trying to get precise understanding of these hands is still really hard. So it's inaccurate and it suffers from all of these occlusions. Okay, so how do we break this problem? Now, thankfully for us, it's not just us as roboticists who want to solve this problem. Our friends at Meta and Zuck also want to solve this problem to create the Metaverse, right? So they have created these amazing Oculus headsets, which, which are actually really good hardware. So I'm not sure how well it will work on the Metaverse goal, but you can actually use this in robotics right now. So this is exactly what we do. We ask humans to wear these Oculus headsets, and as they move their hands, you can get really accurate hand pose estimations over here. So this video you're seeing over here is all in real time, right? So is this person operating this system all in real time, and effectively they're using their hand as a high dimensional joystick. The other nice thing in the system is that since it's VR, you can actually make them look at the robot, so they don't even have to be in the same room as a robot as they are um, as they are working on it. Okay, so we have a system now where humans can actually go out there and teach robots which are not even in the same room how to solve intricate hand manipulation tasks. So, so let's just increase our data, right? So let's just look at a bunch of tasks over here. And so we, we go out there and we get a bunch of data across a few tasks. So the, the few tasks on the left side are more easier ones. As you go to the right, it becomes harder and harder. So what we see is through our experiments, we ask new users, we ask expert users, and we see that overall, you get around a 2x speed up in, um, in giving a demonstration to a robot. But what I think is more interesting is that for the harder tasks, the ones on the lower side over here, and on the right side over here, you cannot even solve these tasks with a single image. You need this sort of 3D understanding of the hand to actually, uh, to actually solve these tasks. Okay, so after we have this, for each of these six tasks, we collect around an hour of data. So for easy tasks, we have a lot more data. For harder tasks, we have lesser data because it takes more time for the human operators to collect it. So after we have the data, we want to probably learn a policy on it or learn a robot model which can, which can operate on it. So how do we do this? So the most standard way is this approach, which is called behavior cloning. Uh, and the idea is quite simple. You take a neural network, you feed in observations, and you ask the neural network to output actions, right? Fairly, fairly standard neural network stuff. So in our case, our observations are images of the hand, and our outputs are actions. So in this case, we have a hand, so the actions are fingertip XYZ movements. So our action space over here is 12 dimension, four times three. Okay, so we try a behavior cloning over here, and surprise, surprise, it just completely fails. Okay, so why is it failing? So, this is, so, so imagine you have this huge, new, huge neural network over here, and it's trying to optimize all its weights just from this weak signal of one hour of data. 
right? And so the signal is just too weak, and it's, so we, it just entirely overfits. It's, it's just not able to generalize, and in evals, it just entirely fits. So to fix it, what we do is we start using these tools that the language and uh, Asian people have found out, which is self-supervised learning. Uh, and so we're going to try to use a lot of these approaches now in trying to train these models uh, so that they go above this 0% success rate. OK, so I know that a few of you may already know what uh, self-supervised learning is, but just a primer for those who don't know. I just want to quickly go over, um, go over it. So first, let's look at what a representation learning problem is. So let me try to actually. I cannot, OK, it's fine. Um, so if I'm talking about a representation learning problem, what it means is I have input which is high dimensional. So think about high dimensional images or text. It goes through something which is called an encoder, which is a neural network, which will bring down uh, this observation to something low dimensional. This low dimensional thing is called the representation. The, the cool thing about self-supervised learning is that this representation will be trained without any labels. So I just give the robot a lot of unlabeled data, and, and, and it should automatically learn what the representations are from that data. You don't need to hand label any detection boxes or key points or anything of that sort. Now, once you have the representation, you can then use this representation to solve a downstream task, for example, classification or Q&A. And for this, you can give it labels. So the hope is that once you learn a good encoder, the amount of data you need to sort of solve the task is actually not that large. You only need small amount of labels to get the downstream learning to work. OK, so now let's see this sort of strategy in action for our hands. So we're going to do this self-supervised learning plus imitation on the hands. And the way it's going to work is really simple. So we'll start off by just doing self-supervised learning. So we take all of our images, right? Do self-supervised learning on it, train an encoder. So I'm throwing the details of the self-supervised learning under the rug, but you can use more standard, um, most standard algorithms over here. Now, once you have an encoder, let's say in deployment time, I have this hand image, and I want to figure out what action to apply. Now, our hypothesis is that if my representations are good, what I can do is I can literally take the encodings find the nearest neighbor, right? And then apply the same action of nearest neighbor on the robot, right? So it's saying that if you have a good matching algorithm, I can just quickly match to what I've seen in the past in my memory and just repeat what I've seen in the past on the robot, right? So it's a very simple strategy. Even like intro to ML students should be able to code it up. Um, and sort of, again, the, the high level idea is you do self-supervised learning to get a good representation. Once you get the good representation, just do nearest neighbors to get the actions. OK, so few of you may think, OK, this is such a stupid, simple approach. This is obviously going to fail. Uh, but no, so here are a few uh, examples for it. So this is on a planar rotation task. It's pretty easy, and it gets it done close to 100% of the time. Here is a slightly harder task where it's like a tubular object, and it, again, has to spin it around without it uh, falling off the hand. Again, it works fairly well here. And now here are the sort of hard tasks. So this is a task where there's this thin card on the table, and it needs to precisely be able to pick it up and lift it up. Right? So, so this is a sort of harder task uh, for which we don't get as high of a performance. But our methods are still, it still works reasonably OK. So overall, for sort of easy tasks, which are maybe the first four, you get reasonable performance. But once you go to these sliding tasks, it just becomes so much harder to actually solve them. OK, so this is all, all well and good. Yeah, this question. Uh, what type of self-supervised learning uh, or algorithm are you running? And is it on the same one hour of data as the behavior plan policy? Exactly. So, uh, so we're using uh, a BYOL um, algorithm, so I'm just taking the details from under the rug. But, um, and in terms of the data, we are, we are just using the data for one task. We're not sharing any of the data. So it's exactly a one is to one comparison over here. Yeah, so the other thing to note is that if you're doing a behavior cloning or even some advanced cloning algorithms, they just entirely fail here. Yeah, there's a question. Are these uh, Google people with lots of data, they tend to do behavior cloning instead of nearest neighbors? Yeah. Uh, like, 
you think yes, you will scale as well as different coding because if you do BC, like you can sort of interpolate in the action space. Yeah. Here, it's neighbor, you will always pick, pick an action in your data set. Yeah, so, so I think this is a great question, and I wish there was a benchmark where we could actually do a one-ish to one comparison. Um, I think that, so you can do some sort of smarter, smarter um, nearest neighbors as well. For example, there's like a retrieval augmented learning where you take a bunch of nearest neighbors and then you do some sort of interpolation of the action. So there are ways to also get interpolative effects. But my hunch is that if you have very, very large data sets, uh, you probably, you know, something like a good representation added on with like, um, uh, with some sort of nearest neighbors or a retrieval algorithm on top, it could give you strong performance. Okay, so, uh, okay, so all of this is good. Let me show you a result which actually really surprised, uh, it surprised almost everyone on the team. So over here, I trained the object with only examples on this cube, okay? And then I take this, I take this policy and I zero shot, try to test it out on arbitrary objects. And it was just like amazing to see that it just works out of the box, zero shot on these new objects. So I'm throwing it a new object and it's automatically able to figure out um, how to turn it, even though in training time it was only shown this one object. So it's also like a consistent result across tasks, so this is the task of flipping the object. And again, you will see that um, on testing time, it can just you know automatically start uh, able to flip it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll take the question slightly slightly later, yeah. Okay, so there's a, a question over here of how is it able to do it? Uh, and this is again a question which we, which we always get, okay, it's a nearest neighbor algorithm, how is it able to sort of reason with like so many different types of objects? And again, one of the really nice thing about nearest neighbors is that it is interpretable. So what I can do is if I'm trying out with a new object, uh, like this triangle shaped thing, I can literally look at the nearest neighbors and see what the matches are like. And so you'll see that it does figure out the sort of shapes of the object when, uh, when the fingers are making a contact with it. So it does realize that the shape of the object in contact actually matters more than the shape of the object out of the contact. And this is again true if you, if you try uh, some other tasks as well. Okay, I'll take the question that you had here. In the training and testing, does the orientation of the base of the hand relative to the main body matter? Like, do you have to keep both of those same? So in this case, we are not moving the wrist at all. Uh, in some subsequent examples, I'll show you examples in which we actually move the wrist. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so since your self-supervised representation learning is kind of like not really reasoning about contact dynamics or any of that other stuff, mm -hmm. how do you think like the representations are able to kind of like capture this notion that you were mentioning before where like the nearest neighbors are like reasoning somewhat about like... Yeah, it's sort of like the, it's, it's based on visual features, right? So it sort of reasons that the visual features of the hand being in certain poses are closer to the hand being in sort of similar poses, but the object maybe being uh, slightly different, right? So it's like, it's what you want a self-supervised algorithm to ideally automatically understand that, uh, that these, two, these two scenes or these two configurations are the same. Okay, so all of our code is also public, so if you want to try it out, if you want to try out our uh, or um, Oculus Code, or try out this nearest neighbor algorithms, uh, it's all on our website, yeah. So, um, this self-supervised learning is on the interaction data with the little cube, or also, does it see the new objects as well? It doesn't see the new objects. It's only, it's only on that cube data, yeah. So, so these models do have some amount of pre-training as well. So it's maybe from like, you know, if you, if you take an initialization of ImageNet pre-train weights, maybe that, that could also help over here. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to preemptively answer some of the questions that you may have. So I have a list of three questions over here that I often get at these talks, and so I'm going to answer them one by one. So the, the first question I often get is, should we do in-domain self-supervised learning, or should we do out-of-domain learning? So what this means is, in domain, is we take examples from, from our task, do self-supervision on that task, and then try to solve the task, right? So the, the pros over here is that our representations learn have a coverage on the task, right? Because it is, it is on data. But the con over here is that you always have small amounts of data, right? So in our case, we only have one hour of data 
per task. So this is the sort of pro and con over here. If you have less amount of data, um, you know, you may you may want to, you know, it may not work as well. Now the other other side is you can do out of domain learning where you take some large internet data set like ego 40 or something, do self supervision over there, and then you know try to transfer those representations or those features onto your robot. The pro over here is that obviously you have huge amounts of data, but on the con side, these representations may not have coverage on your robot task. Now I think that there's an even stronger con over here, and that's that you know if you're doing internet scale, internet scale only works for vision and language, because these are the only two domains where you actually have large amounts of internet data. What if you want to do something for which there is no visual data, right? So one example of this is if you have some tactile sensing. So here is our, another example of a hand, but this hand has a tactile sensor all over its fingers. Here is a small, small representation. Why is this video not playing? Okay, yeah. So here's a representation of the tactile data, and uh, we do the same SSL algorithms, but now on the tactile data itself. So the way it works over here, we, we first ask the human hand to first uh, show, the, show this robot hand how to play with some objects, do SSL on that data, and then immediately use that data to solve these types of tasks. Okay, so the next question I get is what about non-hand tasks? I'm talking about hands, but maybe you don't actually care about hands, you just care about a two-finger gripper. And again, you can use the same idea. So here we have a setup where we are collecting data using a reacher grabber, and then we can very easily transfer these policies to like opening drawers, opening uh, these cabinet doors, and this is also happening with a, a six degree of freedom um, end effector space. Uh, then the last question I get is should we do a parametric learning versus non-parametric, right? Because in our approaches, we have this nearest neighbor head on top of representations. So in which case, which will be better? I think this is a very important question because also in robotics, for many of the learning algorithms, we do not know where everything works because we don't do a good job at benchmarking it. And so there was this recent work at CMU led by UA and um, and Victoria where they, they created a cloud where you can upload your models and they evaluate your models, right? So they had a few tasks over here and so you can get a one to one comparison across different algorithms. So if you go to this paper and you look at figure four of this paper, it shows our, our algorithm which is bin across a bunch of other things like offline learning and you know, decision transformer, uh, internet um, pre-trained models, et cetera. And what you will see is that if you evaluate your models on new objects in training locations, our models work quite well. In fact, it's the, these nearest neighbor models are, uh, are the best over here. But at the same time, if you go to test locations, so locations where uh, it was not shown any object at all, there it completely fails. In fact, on the pouring task, it gets a 0% performance. And this is sort of like intuitive, right? Like if I show the, if I show the robot a new position, which is never seen before. Whatever interpolation you do in training data, you'll never, able, you'll never be able to extrapolate using these algorithms. Okay, so the, the sort of high level point here is that we do have a limitation over here. It's not a silver bullet, um, but if you're sort of staying in domain, these algorithms actually work quite well. Okay, uh, okay, so now after we saw this result, uh, you know, we were like happy that okay, it works well on training, but also we were really sad that it didn't do well on testing. And so we're like, okay, what is actually happening over here? How do we fix this problem? Also, you'll note that this low performance on testing is something you see throughout the board. It's not just with our algorithm, it's just that our algorithm is most susceptible to it. Okay, so what's going wrong here? So let me show you an example of a task. So I'm going to take a robot and ask this robot to flip a bagel. Why bagel instead of pancake? Because we are in New York and we eat bagels instead of pancakes. Um, but yeah, so, so we, I'm going to show one demonstration of flipping this pancake. And then I'm going to ask this imitation learning algorithm to transfer it to a setup where just the initial location of the bagel is changing. And what we see is that it just completely fails over here. It's not able to flip it, right? 
sort of understandable, it's never seen this position, its strategy is not transferring. But now if I change the bagel itself, it's going to wor work even worse. Here it actually throws it off the, uh, off the pan entirely, right? And again, the reason here is it's never seen these new bagels previously, it's obviously going to fail. So this sort of high level point over here is, if, I, if the human shows an example, right, and shows very few examples, the robot is, is never going to take that example using our offline, offline imitation algorithms and transfer it onto new domains, right? It has no capability of doing that at all. And there's also a high level thing where whatever you do eventually in deployment, your robot will fail, right? However good your algorithm is in deployment time, it will always see something that you have not expected and it will fail. It's things which we see all the time in our research, for example, here are some examples of failures on our robots. Uh, so in the first one, it's the hand where it just throws objects off the hand. And on the bottom, it's like our door opening policy where if you sort of hide some of the key features, it just like tries to open in thin hair. It's not just in our work, you know, you have probably seen bloopers of robots all the time. My favorite robot blooper is this one where the robot is supposed to feed a baby milk. You can expect what's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so we, need, we need some way in which once the robot fails, it has some way of not failing in the future, right? How do we give, this, give robots the ability to learn from these failures on the fly in deployment time? So this is a problem which we have also been very interested in. And the key idea is we are going to use the same representations that I spoke to you earlier as a basis to now do adaptation. So here's the, here's the idea. So let's say I had my human information, which is top, which showed me how to successfully flip, uh, flip the bagel. And I have the agent behavior on the bottom, which failed. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these two videos, pass it through my encoder, and get a trajectory of representations from this, right? So from the human, I may get a trajectory of this sort, and then my agent, since it failed, it might look like a separate trajectory. Now what you want to do is you want this robot to somehow figure out how to take this green result and make it match the orange result, right? So the first step in doing this is you need to do something called alignment, where for every point in the expert, you want to figure out what is the optimal point on, on the agent. We do this using an optimal transport matching technique. So this gives us the best match uh, from the human to the agent. But apart from telling us the best match, it also gives us a matching score. It tells us what is, it, it gives us a quantitative value of how close these two trajectories are. And this is great because we can now use this quantitative value as a reward, right? So we can say that this matching score is going to be your reward. And so robot, try to maximize this matching score using RL on the fly in deployment. So, this is exactly how this algorithm works. And what you hopefully want to see is that as it keeps maximizing the match, this green line goes closer and closer to this orange line. Okay, so let me show you some, some examples over here. So, uh, I'm, so in all the examples I'm going to show you, I'm giving, uh, I'm, I'm giving my robot only one minute of human demonstration data. Okay, and then after I give it a minute of human demonstration data, the robot has up to 20 minutes to play around on its own, right? So from the human, from the human perspective, it is one minute of data and then the robot is, is left to do what it has to do. Okay, so here are examples on the hand. So uh, there are a bunch of results over here, but I think the thing which impresses me at least the most is the one where it's picking up a dollar bill. So previously we saw that if you're trying to pick up something really fine, we don't get really high accuracies. But now since this model can actually train on the fly, it can learn from its mistakes and actually uh, solve this task quite well. Then we take the same algorithm. We put this algorithm on our hollow robot and now it can immediately scale and immediately be able to do a bunch of household tasks like opening a cabinet drawer, opening, um, opening just normal drawers, switching off your light. And again, take the same algorithm you can put it on a XAM robot and you can do more precise things like inserting keys into keyholes, flipping this bagel, and doing other sort of um, insertion-like tasks. Now across the board we see that we get around 3x improvement uh, across like 
across the board, across all these, all these tasks versus prior imitation learning, uh, prior imitation learning algorithms. But again, what I think is really interesting is, is the fact that you can try to do some amount of generalization now with this algorithm. So what I mean by that is let's say on the, on the task of trying to pick up a dollar bill, I show you a demonstration over here of the robot trying to pick up a dollar bill. I give you one minute of data on this. And now in deployment time, I just change the, I, I change the object. I change it to either a $50 bill or to a card. And again, this model just immediately works, right? The, the inputs into the model is vision data. So it's similar to the images that you're seeing here. And so it shows you that the representations you learn can actually transfer across objects as well. Here is the same sort of experiment setup, but on the flipping a bagel task. And over here, I, I changed, the, I changed the, the piece of bread. So instead of being a bagel, uh, instead of being that bagel, it's, it's a different bagel, or it's a croissant, or a piece of bread. Uh, it does fail. These algorithms also fail if the strategy was not the right strategy. So we have experiments where we ask it to flip like um, a roti, but the roti is soft, so you cannot use this strategy. You actually have to lift it up and, and rotate. So our, our algorithms it cannot figure out a new strategy altogether. Okay, so if you're interested in this, this is a fairly versatile algorithm. We again have all of our code online. Uh, and so if you want to try it out on your domain, please feel free to try it out. Yes. So the trajectory you were showing was in the representation space, right? Or was it in the robot competition? On the representation space. Okay. Slightly confused. So when you said one minute of data, if you can collect multiple trajectories, how do you decide which one to match? So, so it can it can match to 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 either of them. So it's just like a sequence, and the optimal transport actually it can it can cross. Yeah, it can do mixing. Yeah. So so we did one minute because for one of the tasks you needed two or three demonstrations, but for for a lot of the tasks we only show it like one demonstration. So we use that one minute to allow ourselves to get maybe one more demonstration for some of the harder tasks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so in all of the works I've spoken about so far, there's a human. A human is giving expert demonstration, and the robot is learning from that expert demonstration, right? So this is all in the framework of you're assuming that the human knows what the right thing to do is, and it's able to do, uh, and it's able to sort of imitate that. But now let me give you a, a, a sort of simple example where let's say I ask a human to show me how to go from left to right while avoiding this obstacle. Now, what they would do is they would probably show some examples of going on top, some examples of going on the bottom. And let's say you are trying to use any of these algorithms to like imitate this behavior, right? Now, for those who have actually trained models using like MSC losses, you will know that what's gonna happen is this, a robot is just gonna go straight, and then as it reaches the intersection, there are two actions. It will just say apply no action and get the lowest mean squared error, right? So it'll just stop over there, right? And so this is a problem which we see often in robotics where if I'm trying to learn from, from data which was not curated for a specific task, it was just you know collected in a playful way or just like observing humans, it's very multimodal, right? And so the question is how do we learn these multimodal behaviors when it was not intended to solve one specific task? Okay, so to solve this, we create something called a behavior transformer. And the idea is that, okay, transformers are great at doing multimodal prediction. All of us have heard of, uh, of GPT-4 and ChatGPT. So it's clearly good at doing a multimodal prediction. Uh, but now we, we want to somehow retrofit these transformers to robotic data. So what's the difference between robotic data and language data, right? So, in robotic data, the main difference is that our actions, our outputs, are in a continuous space. And not just in like a low dimensional space, it could be in a high dimensional continuous space, right? Whereas in a transformer, the outputs are in discrete spaces. So that's why it's able to do a multimodality because it's easier to do multimodal prediction when it's a discrete space as, as an output. So what we do in the behavior transformer is we take all of our actions, Right, which is a continuous action data set, and we do a k-means clustering on it. Again, it's a machine learning on a one trick. 
where you take all your actions, do k-means, and you get a cluster of, let's say, k-bins. So I could do a prediction now of um, multimodal outputs just on these bins, right? But in a robotics task, you cannot just be, you know, doing like a bin output because you also need to be precise enough to actually solve the task, right? And so to sort of enable a precision, what we do is we take our continuous action and now we're going to somehow break this continuous action into two parts. One is going to be a discrete component and one is going to be a continuous component. So you can have a discrete bin and, an, and an, uh, a continuous offset from the discrete bin. So effectively it's the same thing. Instead of just viewing it as a single continuous action, I'm viewing it as a, two parts. One is a discrete and one is a continuous. So what this enables me to do is now I can use a GPT-like model to predict discrete bin probabilities for, for each of the k-mean clusters. And then once I sample a bin from there, I can add it with the offset, right? So it's a simple trick which allows you to just take a continuous action and allow a discrete transformer-like model to start operating on top of it. Okay, so initially we were like, okay, you know, let's just do this for like a grander project. But then we just evaluated this and we were like, wow, it just beats all sorts of uh, generative models like IBC, Flow, VAEs, like all sorts of stuff over here, right? And over here, these are all simulated environments. Yeah. I just understand why we need a transformer to model discrete actions. Well, because transformers are one of the best architectures to to do multimodal prediction with uh, with a discrete output space. So it's just like in literature that just I seems to be. Observations that you get more, right? Like you can look at the entire sequence of history, but your action space can be the same even if you look at one like current observation. Yeah, but so it's, it's like as a, as a model class, it's just more expressive, right? So if you have like a bunch of data and you want you want to sort of give sequential sequential data, which our robots are sequential as well, sort of like fits fits a lot more over there. So we did try not using transformers, and it you you always get a lower performance if you switch out a transformer with a RNN or if you switch it out with a MLP, you always get a lower performance. Yeah. Yes. So so if I understand the architecture correctly, the transformer has two hats: one that outputs a bin of the K means uh, clusters, yeah, and one that outputs a continuous correction of that. Exactly. Yeah. I guess uh, I don't understand why, like, like, is the continuous correction also like a discretization of some, like, is it a set of like corrections, or is it like an actual like the transformer outputs a real continuous value? Yeah. So the the output is a real continuous value for each bin. So I can now sample probabilistically for each bin, and then deterministically choose, choose the offset. Okay, so all of these experiments over here are in simulation. So when a robotics person sees it, obvious question is, what about on robots, right? So to do something on a robot, I first need to get this multimodal data. So we had an undergrad in our lab who really wanted to be a part of this lab, and so I was like, okay, can you please uh, try to collect some of the data for us? And amazingly, the student, they collected four and a half hours of data in our kitchen environment, right? So what you're seeing here is almost like a continuous sequence of four and a half hours of data, right? Okay, so I can let this play for like a few more minutes, or I can just skip ahead. Uh, so if you want to see this, if you want to see all of the data, it's, it's, uh, on our website as well. But now, when, I, when I'm viewing this data, I can start viewing it as a large, long sequence of data, right? And so when I have this large sequence of data, what I can then do is I can take two snippets of the data, so one snippet at any arbitrary point, and another snippet within some horizon of that point. I can then concatenate it, and after I do a concatenation, I can use the same uh, transformer which takes as input this information and outputs the actions, right? So I'm going to use a behavior transformer here, but instead of feeding it just a single observation, I'm also feeding it observations of the future. So in a way, this model is trying to predict the, the actions which will let me go from a current observation to a future observation. Okay, so I have the play data, I train this model, and now what this allows me to do 
is in a zero shot way. If I wanted to open an oven, I just show it an image of an open oven, give it to the robot, and the robot will then automatically figure out the sequence of actions to open the oven. Okay, I want to move the pot. I showed an image of the pot being in the right place, ask the robot to go, and it will be able to immediately do this. Right? It's able to do this without any reward information, without any extra data, without any online training again. Okay, you can also do more interesting things. Let's say I want to do two things. I want to open the microwave and also open the oven. Right, so there are two things. So I'll just again show it an image with an open microwave and open oven, and you'll see that this robot will automatically do these two things now. Okay, so if you if you look carefully, you will spot that along with doing this, in between it also turns this knob, right? And that's just like how these transformer models work. They just, you know, they can solve what you want to solve, but they can also do arbitrary things in between that were, you know, outside the realm of what you actually wanted it to do. Okay, so, so again, if you're interested in using this, uh, all the code and transformer models are, are online and uh, feel free to use it. Okay, so now I'm gonna to come to one of my last slides, which is a summary slide. So I talked about this sort of vision of having a constructivist robot learning where we have humans in the loop, humans trying to guide the learning and interaction of our robots. And I, t I talked about three main ideas over here. The first one was on interfacing, that how should humans interface with the robots? Uh, I think using these type of Oculus-like tools is really promising idea, these hardwares, are uh, this sort of hardware of getting data is, is getting more and more mature as well. And we also have algorithms that match well with this and can actually transfer this learning onto real robots. The next thing I talked about was adaptation. So when I actually have to deploy models, these robots are going to fail, right? And so with little amount of data, you want to create algorithms that can quickly adapt to new scenarios, right? Uh, without any additional rewards or without any, uh, any additional human information for those tasks. And lastly, when I'm trying to teach a robot, I do not always want to give it exactly data for what it wants to solve, right? You want to have frameworks where robots can actually learn from large amounts of uncurated data. So for this, you can use models like transformers, like a behavior transformer, and you can sort of, we have shown that you can actually extract useful information and reason about stuff just from this uncurated data. Okay, and then for my last slide, all of this work is done by amazing students in our group. Um, and I'll end here and take any questions that you may have. here, um, I was looking at more on, I give you the least amount of data from humans, and I want to see how fast you can adapt to as many scenarios as you can. So we have looked at things where, okay, I changed, um, um, I changed the spatula, how well does it work? I changed the, um, the pan, how well does it work over there? So I think there's one axis in which you can scale where when I show you demonstrations, instead of just showing one minute of demonstrations, what if I show you an hour of demonstrations across lots of novel scenarios? So I think that's one way to scale. The other way to scale is I show you one demonstration, but then when I'm doing adaptation, I give you more time to adapt to you know, more crazier environments. So I think you could go either of these two routes and get, and get like a generalization to these new environments there. Can you show an example that the robot can um, act on the pre-learned features? Um, I wonder, um, one problem I'm wondering is if the feature is task-dependent. For example, if I want to um, rotate an object with my hand, I'll focus on the feature that uh, my hand, right? If I want to 
place objects on a table, I probably want to focus more on the feature of the table. But the user uh, uh, representation could miss some of the features that are relevant for the current task. Yeah, so, so I guess um, the question is that how do you ensure that your, um, your representations are capturing the relevant features of the environment that you care about, right? So our hope is that if you show it enough of diverse data on that domain, your self-supervised algorithm should automatically be able to figure out is the table important, is the hand important, is the object important. So I think at least from our philosophy, you would go on the data set route and see that if like if you can create algorithms that can automatically extract these representations from it. But at the same time I should note that um, for our adaptation algorithms where we do all of this optimal transport matching and stuff, you could also just use key points for instance. So if, if you have a pre-trained key point model where it just outputs all the key points that you care about, you can just use that in your optimal transport um, adaptation as well. So it's it's compatible with with uh, both both lines of algorithms. I would say, yeah. So it's another question that's similar to that. Uh, and in some of the work in this conditional behavior transformer and in the dextrose touch paper, I believe you use uh, BYOL to extract like yeah. uh, as the SSL algorithm. And I'm curious if, if you think this is the right loss or the right training objective for the uh, representations you need for robotics, since like yeah. usually you care about more of the finer details. Do you care about temporal relations and BOEL works more on like a image level augmentation scale. Like, so I'm yeah. curious if you've explored any other types of uh, yeah. guesses or. Uh, so actually, for for most of our projects, what we do is we try out all possible self-supervised learning algorithms, and we see its performance across all the tasks for which we have data. So we have this huge matrix in some sense, and what we see is that across the board. Because the BYOL algorithm is so simple, the amount of hyperparameter tuning is so less that we can just focus on the tasks and focus on the learning of the tasks. So I would say that when we started out, we did a lot of extensive studies. But then later on, we were like, OK, it's good enough. Let's just use the representations and build something on top of it. But I totally see the point that uh, maybe it's not the best algorithm. Maybe there's something out there. Uh, but from what you see from the machine learning trend is that even if you have a weak algorithm, if you have enough of data, it normally is able to account for it. So as long as your algorithm can scale with, uh, with having more data, it's, it's a fine algorithm. Uh, of course, if someone out, out here is, uh, is going to give me a new self-supervised algorithm and says that it's going to improve performance, I would gladly take that algorithm and improve, improve uh, all of our robots. Yes. Uh, speaking of the self-supervision point in scaling, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on like how you actually want to try to scale these sorts of things up. Because I think in most of the, the papers that you showed for now, it seems like it's still a relatively small amount of data, right? As you mentioned, it's like one hour. Yeah. So like if you want to actually kind of have these self-supervised approaches be more broadly applicable to like more robots and more scenarios, what do you think is kind of like the way to get there? Yeah. It's a great question. So. Maybe if I come and give a talk again a year from now, I can, uh, I can talk to you about, uh, about what we're doing right now. And that's, um, I think we are looking at, at, at how to scale things. Uh, and I think the problem with scale in robotics is that you have to actually go out there and collect this data, right? And so it takes time, right? So for example, um, folks at Google, um, at Google, for instance, they took a whole year to get a bunch of data across multiple humans as well. And only then they'll be able to show like things like RT1 or SACAN on that, on that data. And so if as an academic lab you're trying to do this, it'll be probably a little slower. So we have to be more creative in terms of how we get higher quality data. And so that's what we are looking at right now. And um, you know, hopefully at some point we can, we can share that work. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned to scale the generalization of imitation learning method, we can either collect more demonstration data and let the robot to uh, collect more data by itself. So for collecting more demonstration data, that's basically the RT1 result, and then the other one would be QT opt would be the example. However, do you think, um, however for RT1, they have so much data, but it still does not generalize to different objects. It can only like chain trajectories together. So is this a really scalable solution to imitation learning? So I think, 
um, it's often hard to make a conclusion from just one work because there's only sort of one team which has tried to learn models on that because no one else can actually learn models or deploy it except the people who created that data set. So I think there might be a thing that the way it's deployed, the way it's learned, it may not be the best way and we do not, we, we haven't had enough time to do research on that problem to see what's the best way to actually deploy it. And I also think that in terms of, uh, of models, right, if you think about how these language data sets or these visions, uh, data sets work. It's not just number of data points, it's also how much of diversity is in the data, right? Think about the internet, think about all sorts of random data from like code to Reddit posts, like it's just so much of random data. I think that amount of diversity is what's actually needed. All of the data which you see um, in robotics, any of the large scale efforts, like including my past work, it's always in very, small environments. It's either on a tabletop or in one kitchen or in two or three kitchens, right? I think if you want to go down the route of scale, you need to somehow think even bigger than this and go across like, you know, hundreds or thousands of homes and get all of that data from there. So, so yeah, so it might not just be the raw number of data points, but also like it's a combination of number of data points and the diversity of data which you have. So hopefully, you know, both doing more research on the algorithm side and also doing more research on how do you get higher quality data across different environments is going to be useful. So what do you think about the role of simulation in terms of generalization? So for example, for a lot of imitation learning work on real data, I actually see less generalization compared to some sim to real transfer work because at least sim to real transfer, they can cross, they can generalize to the real world. And also, in terms of scaling data, isn't simulation the one of the cheapest ways to scale the amount and diversity of data? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question. A lot of my students ask me this, that, okay, I used to do simulation uh, earlier, now I've stopped doing simulation um, as much. And I think I view simulation more as a nativist algorithm, right, because it's an algorithm where, as a human, as a human engineer, you know, you need to know exactly what all the rules of physics are because Mujoko environment or your simulation environment has all of the rules of physics in there. Then as a human, you need to structure the problem. You need to exactly say, okay, um, you know, what your environment is going to look like. Here are all the variables uh, which are actually going to change. Then you have to write all your reward functions, right? Then you have to train a model, make sure that your model can actually transfer. And then it transfers on that one task. Right? If I have to choose a different task in some different home, in some different environment, I have to just redo this process again and again. There's no, like, there's no sim to real transfer across tasks, right? And so I think from a, from a philosophy of, of learning, if you want to create a robot which can just go out there, it sees some new problems, it is able to solve new problems on the fly. Um, I think asking a sim to real algorithm to just scale across many, many tasks without having a human in the loop just seems really hard. Yeah. Uh, so the CAD video that you started with, uh, you showed the human making the CAD do something. Yeah. But I feel that also misses like how babies learn, for instance, that you don't necessarily make the baby do everything. You, the babies can just watch you and then learn yeah. things. So, and in all your experiments, it was very much sort of first person data, right? Yes. Yeah. Robot data. Yeah. And is there a role for third person data? And if so, why have you not explored it so much? Here? I think so, yeah. I think there's definitely a role of third person data. Um, I think the reason I have not explored it is because uh, amazing researchers like yourself are, are exploring it. And uh, hopefully when you have a solution there, I would love to take those interfaces and cross the gap between what human morphology does and what a robot morphology can do. So for example, um, we have this hand with like a tactile sensor on it, right? It's very hard to just directly transfer like uh, videos of human because you do not know how much force they're applying, you do not know exactly where all the contacts are happening. So I think there is a lot of interesting research in this area and once it matures, I would love to take that and apply some of our algorithms on that type of, uh, on that type of data as well. Yeah.